my aunt asked me not all that long ago, were you surprised that you became a writer? And I said, absolutely not. I always knew I was going to be a writer of one kind or another. I thought novels at the beginning. I thought I'll be writing short stories and novels. <laughs> Dorothy Catherine Fontana, born March 25, 1939, passed on December 2, 2019. She came into this world in Sussex, New Jersey. However, she was raised in Tatua, New Jersey, graduating from Passaic Valley Regional High School in 1957. Even though she only worked on one comic book directly, IDW's Enterprise Experiment, which was a sequel to her third season episode, The Enterprise Incident, her influence can be felt in the world of comic books as far back as the 1960s. So it's with great pleasure that I present to you a look at the life and career of one of television's most prolific writers, D.C. Fontana. But before we begin, I want to remind you that I do reviews and columns for two sites, Comic Crusaders and Comics for Sinners. I have two franchises available, Carl Vincent Vampire Hunter and Adolescent Radioactive Samurai Platypi, available on Amazon, Comixology, and Indie Planet. Make sure you check out my new book, Comics, Pop, Culture, and Politics, also available on Amazon. It examines how politics has infiltrated our beloved franchises in both comic books and the visual media. Check out the links in the comments section below to discover the latest Carl Vincent Vampire Hunter trade paperback, which is Dracula Rising, plus the new book, Comics, Pop, Culture, and Politics, also posters, t-shirts, and a lot more, available on Teespring. So check out those links in the comments section below. If you love comics as much as I do, you're going to subscribe to my channel, ring the bell to stay informed when I put out a new video, and I welcome your comments on today's show. Let me know what you thought in the comments section below. Did you like what you saw today? Do you agree with me? Do you disagree with me? Are you a fan of Dorothy C. Fontana? Do you even know who she is? Let me know in the comments below. Once again, if you love comics as much as I do, you're going to subscribe to my channel, ring the bell to stay informed, for when I put out a new video. And now let's get on with our look at DC Fontana. She decided at the age of 11 that she wanted to become a novelist. During her youth, she wrote horror stories featuring herself and her friends. She attended Farley Dickinson University, where she graduated with an associate degree as an executive secretarial major. And after she graduated from college, she went to New York City, where she got a job working at Screen Gems as the junior secretary to the president of the studio. Shortly after his death, she returned to her home state briefly, then moved to Los Angeles. She gained employment in the typing pool at the Review Studios, working as a secretary to writer Samuel A. Peoples during his time on the Western television series Over the Trail. When the series was canceled, they moved under the tall man, and she sold him a story called A Bounty for Billy. She was 21, and it was her first story sale. She continued to work with Peoples on the Western television series Frontier Circus. During her work with Peoples, she sold six story ideas, including one on Shotgun Slade for Nat Holt. She was restricted in a particular episode, since the series only allowed for four main speaking roles, including the main character. Another episode on which she worked had to be rewritten to remove any outside scenes, as it was raining during the shoot, which couldn't be delayed for the weather to change. These were all created under the name of Dorothy. C. Fontana. Peoples moved on from the company, but Fontana stayed and returned to the typing pool. She saw a position on a Marine Corps-based series called The Lieutenant and applied. Fontana began working as a secretary for producer Del Reisman. Around this time, she adopted the gender-blind name form, D.C. Fontana, for her written works to prevent her pitches being prejudiced based on her gender, as she was one of the few female writers at NBC at the time. The Lieutenant was created by Gene Roddenberry, whom she ended up working directly for after his secretary fell ill. After finding out she wanted to become a writer, Roddenberry encouraged her. In 1964, she published her first novel, a western called Brazos River with Harry Sanford. The lieutenant ran for one season. After the lieutenant was canceled, Roddenberry began work on Star Trek and Fontana was introduced to science fiction, which had not been a previous interest of hers. Following encouragement from associate producer Robert H. Jessman, and as he, she had been working on the show from the start of the development, Roddenberry assigned her the task of writing a teleplay on an idea he had for an episode, The Day Charlie Became God. She worked the premise into the script for Charlie X, although she gave Roddenberry the story credit and only took the teleplay credit for herself. It was broadcast as the second episode of the series. 
Although this was an adapted story, she also wrote Tomorrow is Yesterday from her own idea. By the middle of the first season, Stephen Carabazos, the story editor, had already left the production, and it seemed that the second editor, John D.F. Black, was also looking to leave. So Roddenberry gave Fontana the task of rewriting the episode, This Side of Paradise. Both Roddenberry and the network were satisfied with Fontana's work, and she became the new story editor instead of Roddenberry's secretary in September 1966. She subsequently came up with the ideas for the episodes for Journey to Babel and Friday's Child. There were other works that she was formerly credited with based on the Writers Guild arbitration that were only rewrites of episodes. She later recalled completely rewriting The Ultimate Computer as the original writer was unwilling to make the recommended changes. She said that this was a common issue. You either had to do a light polish, sometimes just on dialogue, and then you took no credit for that, of course because it would not be fair. But when you really do a total script overhaul, then it has to automatically go into the Writers Guild for arbitration. She was one of the four writers to rewrite Harlan Ellison's The City on the Edge of Forever, alongside Roddenberry, Gene Kuhn, and Kara Bethsos, who had all made changes at different times to Ellison's displeasure. Fontana's draft, submitted on January 23rd, 1967, was superseded by three further versions by Roddenberry. She left the team prior to the third season, but continued to write scripts on a freelance basis. These included The Enterprise Incident, That Which Survives, and The Way to Eden. The last two were credited under the pseudonym Michael Richards. She disliked some of the changes made in The Enterprise Incident, such as the size of the cloaking device, and found working with her replacement difficult, as the new story editor didn't understand the basics of the series such as what the transporter did and how old Leonard McCoy was meant to be. Leonard Nimoy credited her for expanding Vulcan culture within Star Trek. He was unsure when this side of paradise was posed, as Fontana had changed the romantic lead from Hikaru Sulu to Spock, but he enjoyed being able to act out emotions with the character, and also praised her work on Journey to Babel and the Enterprise incident. Nimoy also felt that unusually among Star Trek's writers, Fontana was able to write believable female characters who were fully developed in the screenplay. Fontana's freelance status meant that she could write for several series, including westerns once again. In 1969, she was nominated for a Writers Guild of America Award for an episode of Then Came Bronson titled 2% of Nothing. From JimBronson.com In the heat of the summer, Jim rolls into a desert town in Arizona with no money and ends up taking a job on an oil rig with four would-be oil men with broken down equipment and one lonely wife. Filmed along the Apache Trail outside Phoenix, the sun was hot and the wind blew a warm breeze to spark the blood of the young bucks looking at that lonely wife. Jim helps her by taking a reduced salary for the group to be able to maintain the rig. However, this eventually comes to a point and a lease investor shows up to pick up options and become a partner. Jim sees the futility of this operation and sells his share to a roughneck. And the setting sun on that ribbon of highway now is a much more welcome sight after the back-breaking work as a roughneck on an oil bearer. The dreams people have, the all-consuming dream is the point here. To the point of no return and the disregard of the others may not share your dream or aspirations. During the early 1970s, she acted as Roddenberry's assistant on the Questor tapes, but was not involved in the writing. She did, however, write the novelization. Fontana wrote a script for Roddenberry's Genesis 2. She was hired as both story editor and associate producer on Star Trek The Animated Series. Roddenberry was used as a consultant and not the showrunner. One of her tasks on the show was to receive pitches for episodes, which she would then relay to Roddenberry. The series won the Daytime Emmy Award for Outstanding Children's Series in 1975. After that project ended, she became the story editor on The Fantastic Journey, and although it was soon cancelled, working with Leonard Katzman led to Fontana writing for the Logan's Run television series. She also sold stories to several more science fiction series, including The Six Million Dollar Man, Buck Rogers in the 25th Century, and Auto Man, although the latter never became an episode due to the cancellation of the show. Fontana wrote scripts with her brother for the Waltons and under her own name again for the streets of San Francisco. One possibly apocryphal story involves Fontana's experience writing for Battlestar Galactica. She was reportedly so dissatisfied with revisions made to her script for Gun on Ice Planet Zero that she used a pseudonym, but the story spread, resulting in other known science fiction writers refusing to work on the show. When work on Star Trek The Next Generation began, Roddenberry requested her to join the team, and she offered to pitch some story ideas. After he suggested something involving an alien space station, she worked the idea to become the pilot encounter at Firepoint. She was offered the position of story editor on the crew, but wanted to be an associate producer. Writer Robert Lewin found this difficult initially, as, due to her being registered with the Writers Guild of America, he could not contractually ask her to do certain tasks, 
as she had offered and Roddenberry was expecting him to. He did anyway. She was eventually given her associate producer position. Lewin said that this fight caused some resentment between Fontana and Roddenberry as she left during the first season. She had written a story that would have brought Nimoy onto the show as Spock, but it was rejected by Roddenberry. When the actor and character later appeared on the fifth season episode Unification, she felt that her original take on The Next Generation was the right one. Her work at a counter at Firepoint was expanded by Roddenberry at the character Q, as when she wrote her draft, it was unclear whether it would be a single or double episode. She had her work on that episode, The Naked Now, credited to the pseudonym J. Michael Bingham. Her relationship with Roddenberry became so strained prior to her departure that she began tape recording their conversations. After she left, she put in a claim with the Writers Guild that she had also worked as a story editor on the series, but was never paid for it. This was settled amicably with Paramount Television. Pocket Books editor David Stern approached Fontana to write a Star Trek novel, and she proposed writing the story of Spock's first mission of the Enterprise, joining a crew led by Captain Christopher Pike. The Vulcan's glory also included Scotty's first mission and an exploration of number one. She described this as a pleasant experience, particularly working with Stern. She returned to the Star Trek franchise with Dax, an episode of Star Trek Deep Space Nine. Peter Allen Fields brought Fontana onto the series after he had previously worked with her on The Six Million Dollar Man. She found the episode difficult to write due to the characters not yet being fully explored since it was early in the first season. The nature of the character of Jadzia Dax's opinion of her previous symbionts had not yet been settled and was only resolved when Fields rewrote part of Fontana's work. The duo was jointly credited with the screenplay. Fontana wrote the episode The War Prayer in the first season of Babylon 5, based on a premise by series creator J. Michael Straczynski. And here's a synopsis from TV Tropes. Dellen is entertaining Shaw Mayan a renowned Minbari poet and an old friend of hers in the quarters. They have spent the evening reminiscing, but must part for the evening as Mayan is preparing to travel to Earth to present one of her works, and Deline's day begins even earlier. As Mayan walks down the corridor, strange sounds are heard, and a shadow moves in the darkness as she looks around in fear. She is suddenly stabbed in the stomach as she falls to the ground. A strange mark is burned into her forehead, and a human voice says, Stay away from Earth, freak. The next morning, an enraged Delenn is in Sinclair's office demanding answers. When he says that they are doing all they can, she retorts, Then you are required to do better, Commander. Much better. Garibaldi notes that this is the sixth attack on a prominent alien, and that the perpetrators are known as Home Guard, an anti-alien group that is growing in influence. Sinclair wants them dealt with before they undermine Babylon 5's mission, but Garibaldi says there are too many who agree with them, and even more than that, don't care. In MedLab, Garibaldi is asking Mayan about the attack. She remembers only a shadow and can think of no one who would want to harm her for any reason. Only the pilot was available for research purposes, so she spent some time speaking with Straczynski to get a feel for the series. She went on to work on the episode Legacies, which was the only installment of the first season that was created by a freelancer, but not based based on one of Straczynski's ideas. He asked her to pitch and choose the idea for Legacies over a premise of his own for her season two episode, A Distant Star. She wrote the script based on an idea by Straczynski. Fontana created the storyline for the interplay entertainment video game, Star Trek, Secret of Vulcan Fury. The project was directed by John Meredith Lucas, whom she had collaborated with on the original series episodes, The Enterprise Incident and The Ultimate Computer. Together with Derek Chester, she also wrote the scripts for Bethesda Softworks video games, Star Trek Legacy, and Star Trek Tactical Assault. Todd Vaughn, Bethesda's Softworks VP of Development, described her as one of Star Trek's most prolific and distinguished writers. Fontana wrote the episode to serve all my days for the fan-made production Star Trek New Voyages. Her work on the Enterprise incident in the third season of Star Trek led to IDW Publishing, seeking to have her write a sequel in comic book form for Star Trek Year 4, titled The Enterprise Experiment. After joining the Writers Guild of America in 1960, she served on the board between 1988 and 1990, and between 1991 in 1993. She was awarded the Morgan Cox Award for Services to the Guild in 2002. She was inducted into the American Screenwriters Association Hall of Fame twice in 1997 and then 2002. We're going to look at some of Fontana's scripts. Of course, we don't have the time to look at all of them. These are some of the significant ones. We're going to look at some ideas from the Internet Movie Database. The Tall Man, a bounty for Billy. Pat Garrett is wounded trying to prevent an express office robbery. His new deputy finds evidence 
evidence that the shooter was his close friend, Billy the Kid. Billy swears he's innocent of the crime and flees the posse sent to arrest him so he can find the men who are trying to frame him for the crime. This show also features a young Leonard Nimoy as Deputy Johnny Swift. So DC Fontana was working with Leonard Nimoy from one of her very first assignments. Fred from Florida says, Exciting episode of The Tall Gun with Pat Garrett laid up and semi-comatose from a gunshot wound to the chest. Leonard Nimoy is convincing as Deputy Johnny Swift which is a great name for a character. Nimoy appears in two episodes of The Tall Man. We are also introduced to the Yalorian Rita, played by actress Marianne Hill, who will appear in five episodes. I write, a bounty for Billy, 10 stars. She also did work for the Wild Wild West, including The Night of the Watery Death. While at the Mermaid Bar, Agent James West is shot with a blow dart by a woman disguised as a mermaid. When he comes to, West finds himself aboard a ship where he meets an unusual woman with a mysterious compact. Suddenly, the ship is attacked by a fire-breathing dragon and the ship explodes. After floating ashore, Jim meets Artie and they unveil the secrets of a new weapon, a dragon-like torpedo attracted to a homing device in a woman's compact. Together, they must find the weapon before a government ship loaded with a cargo of explosives arrives in the San Francisco harbor. She also wrote Night of the Deadly Bubble, investigating a series of mysterious tidal waves. Wes and Gordon find a fanatical marine environmentalist, and she wrote both of those episodes under the pseudonym Michael Edwards. And of course, her most prominent work was with Star Trek, and on that program, she wrote The Way to Eden, as Michael Richards, also that which survives with the same pseudonym, Michael Richards. She wrote The Enterprise Incident and the teleplay for The Ultimate Computer, also by any other name. Then she wrote Friday's Child along with Journey to Babel, and she did the teleplay uncredited for Cat's Paw. She wrote the story for This Side of Paradise and Tomorrow is Yesterday. Then she wrote the teleplay for Charlie X. She worked on more westerns as time went by. She wrote for The Big Valley, the episode The Prize. While returning to the ranch with a horse he just purchased, Heath becomes sidetracked and ends up taking home a baby after the mother dies. The father, an outlaw, eventually heads for the Barclays to take custody and into a bounty hunter's trap. The Prize, an Englishman with a large gambling debt, agrees to smuggle whiskey onto an Indian reservation to pay off his losses. En route, he meets up with Victoria on the way to the reservation with medical supplies, and they find the road there is full of unexpected surprises. Then she worked on the television series Logan's Run as a story editor on the following episodes. Stargate, Turnabout, Night Visitors, Carousel, Future Past, The Judas Goat, Fear Factor, Crypt, Half-Life, Man Out of Time, the Innocent, Capture. Now with Capture, she wrote the story with the pseudonym once again of Michael Edwards. The synopsis is that James Borden, a hunter, captures Logan, Jessica, Rem, and Francis after Francis captures the three runners, where Borden decides to free Logan and Francis, and he decides to hunt them like animals, where Logan and Francis decided to join forces and set out to rescue Jessica and Rem from Borden. Can Logan and Francis save Jessica and Rem? And she also worked on the series as story editor for the episode The Collectors and Logan's Run. She also worked on Buck Rogers in the 25th century. One episode was Planet of Amazon Woman. Earth is negotiating with the planet Ratha to maintain its right to mine barbarite on the Ruthan held planet Nadira. While Buck Rogers is flying to keep the space between the planets clear, he is lured to the planet Arzantia by a phony distress call from two beautiful women. After bringing them home, a man named Cassius Thorne takes Buck into custody and has him sold and mated with the Prime Minister's daughter, Ariella Dine. Meanwhile, Wilma Deering arrives looking for Buck and learns that Buck is planning to meet with the Ruthan leader and expose the truth that Zantia has no warriors. Buck must escape Zantia while he finds a way to smooth the negotiations with the troublesome Ruthen diplomat. And she continued her work with Star Trek on the Next Generation television series, writing the story for Heart of Glory, the teleplay for Too Short a Season and Lonely Among Us, The Naked Now with the pseudonym J. Michael Bingham, also the teleplay with that pseudonym. And of course she wrote the pilot Encounter at Farpoint. She also worked on the television series version of War of the Worlds. The meek shall inherit. The synopsis, an alien triad is sent to hijack a transport truck containing a needed power source. They are seen possessing three homeless men by Molly Stone, a vagrant from the hospital where Sylvia Van Buren lives. Sensing nearby alien activity, 
Sylvia has an episode to warn Harrison, then she escapes with Molly. Hearing of her escape, Harrison searches for her with Suzanne, finally go into a trucking yard where vagrants receive handouts. Sylvia and Molly are there, as are the aliens awaiting the truck. They possess Molly. The truck arrives as the aliens move. Iron Horse and his Omega Squad arrive and kill them all. We've already looked at some of her work for Babylon 5. She also was a writer on A Distant Star Legacies as well as The War Prayer. And the final synopsis, we're going to look at what she did with Gene Roddenberry's Earth Final Conflict. Coming back to the first mentor who encouraged her to write, Gene Roddenberry's final series was Earth Conflict. The episode she worked on was Miracle. William Boone sees a girl that's ready to fly off a skyscraper. He rushes to the roof and tries to convince the girl not to jump. Suddenly, he recognizes her. It's Julie Payton who made the news big time years ago. She had an accident in which she lost her parents and both of her hands. She received two artificial hands, but clearly she isn't too happy with them. Boone succeeds in his mission, and Dan is intrigued by the events. He tells Talon that technology is almost at the point that regeneration of human parts is possible. In fact, it's already there, but still in an experimental stage. FBI agent Sandoval makes the suggestion the girl's healing can be used as propaganda for the Talon's cause. Other television series that DC Fontana has worked on includes Ben Casey, The Road West, Lancer, The High Chaparral, Bonanza, Here Comes the Brides, Ghost Story, The Streets of San Francisco, Land of the Lost, Kung Fu, Bert D'Angelo Superstar, The Waltons, Dallas, He-Man and the Masters of the Universe, The Legend of Prince Valiant, Hypernauts, Captain Simeon and the Space Monkeys, Reboot, Silver Surfer, and Beast Wars, Transformers. Her last credited work was on Star Trek New Voyages. She came full circle, getting her big break as story editor for the original Star Trek, and her final credited work was Star Trek New Voyages, which we've already discussed. DC Fontana married cinematographer Dennis Skotak. Tragically, she passed away this December 2nd, 2019, at the age of 80, following a short illness. And that was our look at the career of one of Star Trek's most prolific writers, Dorothy C. Fontana. I hope you enjoyed the show. I want to remind you once again, I do reviews and columns for two sites, Comic Crusaders and Comics for Sinners. Check those out and let me know what you think of my reviews and columns on the site. Also, two franchises are available from KRG Comics, Carl Vincent Vampire Hunter and Adolescent Radioactive Samurai Platypi. You can find them on Amazon, Comixology, and Into Planet. Make sure you check out my new book, Comics, Pop, Culture, and Politics. It examines how politics has infiltrated our beloved franchises in both comic books and the visual media. Check out the links in the comments section below to discover the latest Carl Vincent Vampire Hunter trade paperback, Dracula Rising. Also the new book I discussed, Comics, Pop, Culture, and Politics. The links to posters and t-shirts and other things available on Teespring. Check out the links in the comments below once again for all that I've mentioned. And if you love comics as much as I do, you're going to subscribe to my channel. Ring the bell to stay informed when I put out a new video. I welcome your comments on today's show. Did you like what you saw today? Did you agree with me? Did you disagree with me? Are you a fan of Dorothy C. Fontana? Do you like her work? If so, what's your favorite work by Dorothy C. Fontana? Let me know. Let's discuss it in the comments section below. Until next time, this is Kevin Gibbons saying so long and keep reading comics.